So if you can not only just complete the thing, but you can choose to enjoy, and this is actually something you can choose to do, you choose to enjoy the experience of making your bed, the experience of having that cold shower, the experience of going on your morning run, right? The experience of um, you know, doing these little bits and bobs and bit pieces of admin in your morning that you don't want to do and you choose to enjoy it anyway. You're learning how to associate the dopamine uh, uh, mechanism, okay? The dopamine system to success those of another breath. This the first step in searching to be nothing less than be the best in what you do to prove their strength in being you. Learn so much in chasing dreams that I never would in school. What's up, guys? Kieran Everly here from the Pocket Coach Podcast, where science meets mindfulness on the topics of mental health and performance. In other words, personal development. Today, we're going to be speaking about these quote-unquote happy chemicals that get tossed around a lot. Now, some of you might know about these quite well, and some of you might not, right? And then some of you have, you know, seen a bunch of Instagram posts on them. And these are dopamine serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. Now, many of you might know of the dopamine as a reward chemical, serotonin as, um, you know, this feel-good chemical, uh, endorphins as a sort of like painkiller slash happy chemical, if you will, uh, oxytocin as this love hormone, if you will, right? So this is sort of what gets tossed around a lot. And I came across an image that I've actually seen quite a few times that uh, constantly, you know, the um, Instagram handle that's attached to the image keeps getting changed. And uh, essentially, uh, I, I, I stumbled across it again and I thought, man, a lot of this stuff is actually misinformation or at least half misinformation. Like some of it's very true, um, but the extent of its truth is actually quite limited. So that's why I wanted to jump on today and really go into a bit more depth as to what these chemicals are, right? where they come from, how they're there, how we produce them, and then also how to stimulate them. Because how we produce them and how they're stimulated is it's a different story. And unfortunately, because of this misinformation that's out there, people are then taking missteps in order to work on themselves in these ways, uh, not really understanding the underlying mechanism or reason why these are produced through these specific tools that we'll touch on. So we're going to keep it nice and succinct. Uh, I should warn you, firstly, I'm not a doctor, all right? I'm simply studying neuroscience myself. Uh, yes, I'm, um, I'm half formally <laughs> studying it. I've also done a lot of my self-research in the last uh, three years as well because I'm so passionate about the topic. Uh, and I have had the opportunity as well of studying under two different Buddhist monks. Um, so I'm able to actually intertwine this uh, mindfulness aspect into this process so I can understand the experience of what it feels like to be in oxytocin, what it feels like to be in a dopamine state, a dopaminergic state or serotonergic state, right? Um, or endorphin state, right? So these experiences are, are really understandable when one's able to really tune into the experience that's happening in those moments. So as we start, I want to remind you guys that I do this all for free. Okay, I don't, um, you know, I don't do ads. I don't, you know, do any of this stuff. I actually um, work with some really incredible people that, um, yeah, actually invest quite a lot in themselves uh, when it comes to coaching work, when it comes to personal development, and um, quite frankly, a lot of this information um, is. Much as there's, there's sort, of sort of scattered information all out there, you know, at the end of the day, this is completely free. So um, the reason why I share that is, well, not because I you know, want you guys to um, be like, oh, okay, I'll subscribe. But I really do want you guys to be like, oh, right, I'll subscribe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, all I'm asking is just simply this one thing, okay? You don't need to subscribe. Don't even need to share it if you don't feel it. But if you feel that you gain something from this episode or this podcast in general, it would do me a massive favor uh, if you uh, do either subscribe or share it with someone or both, right? If you uh, come across someone and they're like, oh, whoa, bro or sis, you know, where'd you learn that? Yeah, give a shout out to your boy Kez, right? to your boy on the Pocket Coach podcast. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, but only if this serves you. If it doesn't, hey, it's all good. I completely understand. I uh, would still appreciate a little five-star review. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> That's like I mentioned, only if this serves you. All right, so let's dive into it. 
I'm gonna keep this succinct, all right? I'm gonna keep this short and sharp as possible without too much Keza banter. I do throw in some Keza banter here and there, where I go on little tangents when I'm on my own, because, yeah, that's what happens when Kiz is on his own. And uh, also, I want to give a pre-warning that, again, my knowledge is quite limited here. As I mentioned, I'm not a doctor, right? My formal study in this space is quite limited. And uh, therefore, even though compared to the you know average Joe, yes, my knowledge will be more elaborate and deeper, which is great um, and helpful. However, uh, it's going to be very simplistic in comparison to what's out there. So don't expect me to go super deep into anything crazy. Uh, this is just going to be nice and simplistic understandings, which is probably beneficial you know, for someone that hasn't heard too much about these chemicals. Let's start with dopamine. Okay, because dopamine is, uh, 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 this is the one that's really, uh, has, there's a lot of confusion around dopamine. Um, it's perceived as this reward chemical, and that's its sort of main function. That's actually not its primary function. As a matter of fact, dopamine's primary function is motivation. is to move us towards a reward or to move us towards a so-called er situation that is away from pain. So dopamine drives us towards something, right? So um, basically this, I'm going to read off the uh, post that I've seen uh, pop up quite a few times. And they say sort of dopamine is um, you can stimulate it through eating food, achieving a goal, completing a task, uh, and self, uh, yeah, self-care activities. Now, uh, eating food, yes, will produce dopamine. However, sometimes eating food will actually inhibit dopamine. Interesting. Let's speak on that for a moment. Firstly, all right, if the um, you've actually got this reward pathway that, yes, has dopamine. However, there is also a reward pathway error that can sometimes come to play, which means that if your uh, anticipation for something is huge and then the experience of whatever you're anticipating isn't as grand as the anticipation itself, dopamine will not fire the inhibitory mechanism will come into play and you'll actually experience almost this painful sensation, if you will. And it's not necessarily going to be physically painful, but it might be mentally painful. Man, this just wasn't quite what I wanted, right? So as an example, uh, if you were anticipating that the person you wanted to ask out was going to say yes and they didn't, oh man, that's really painful, right? If you already knew they weren't going to say yes, right, and you're just trying wouldn't hurt as much. That's dopamine. Dopamine can actually be associated strongly with pain. Another example, right? If you offer a kid some candy, okay? And you're like, hey, I'm going to give you some candy. Uh, it sounds a bit creepy, but you get my point. <laughs> this is just an example. I've never done this, trust me. <laughs> and you offer the kid candy, all right? Uh, and the kid's like, oh my, I'm so, I really want candy. Yes, right? The level of dopamine produced in that situation is huge. Like I mentioned, motivation. This motivates the kid to go for that candy and they'll do what they can for that candy, right? And yes, you can hear, um, you can already think of situations where this can be problematic. Now, when, say, I now all of a sudden, actually, sorry, I don't have any candy on me. The level of dopamine fired is very, is non-existent. Therefore, they experience a strong level of pain. So dopamine actually has a pain association as well as a motivation and a reward association as well. So there's actually multiple factors that tie in with dopamine, which is really fascinating. All right. Now, in order to actually leverage dopamine to our advantage, right, we want to not only utilize it for the motivation, but we also need to leverage it in such a way that that motivation isn't going to, or that anticipation isn't going to outweigh the reward. I'll give another example because it makes a lot of sense. I'm sure many of you have had this happen to you before, maybe. You know, when a friend's recommended, hey, uh, you know, go to Bob's Pizza. Uh, Bob's Pizza is the best New York type pizza in the world. Never tried anything as good as this. And you go along to Bob's Pizza, sit down, you have a pizza, and it's, you know, it's moderate. It's, it's like decent, it's good, but it's not amazing. It's not the best in the world. You're not going to have very much dopamine of a release, even though the reward's going to be there because it's, you know, nice savory food. Right, so yes, it feels good. So as I mentioned, it's not all food; it's something like savory or sweet food. Generally, yes, will stimulate dopamine um, based on whether sugar or uh, certain fats are present in your stomach, okay, and whether that's also tasted through 
the mouth so it's stimulated through your um, oral senses as well as the senses in your stomach, all right? And this stimulates dopamine. Now, if the level of dopamine is less than the amount that was used in anticipation, again, you're probably going to experience this feeling of, I don't want to go here. Yeah, this is like, I'm never going to come here again. Why? Because the level of dopamine anticipated was greater than the level of dopamine within the experience. So, this is how we come to an understanding. Uh, completely lost my way there. I was going to go into something and then I was going into another thing. I'm sure you guys get that. It's been a long day. I had a lot of conversations today. So, I was literally on the phone to my friend for over an hour. And here's Kiza going on some banter again. Uh, so, yeah, you can understand. I've done a lot of chatting. So, here we are finishing off the day with good chats on dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin. So, ultimately... Uh, however, on the other hand, if you were experiencing low-level anticipation, say your friend said, hey, uh, Bob's pizza is pretty good. You should go try it. And you go along and try it. And it's, you know, it's, it's still a really good pizza. The level of dopamine you'll experience in the uh, actual situation will be greater than the level of dopamine in anticipation. Therefore, you're likely to become addicted. Okay. So that addiction experience can happen. So dopamine is highly addictive as well. So it can be also problematic. So there's so many factors that tie into dopamine. However, you're obviously here in order to understand, okay, well, how is it stimulated, right? However, it's important to know uh, when we want to stimulate this because if you're just constantly going out there trying to find ways to stimulate dopamine, right? Try cocaine. <laughs> That's literally probably the quickest and most intense way you're going to get dopamine. Um, so I please don't do that. Firstly, it's very, very uh, highly problematic uh, neurologically, biologically. Um, you're going to cause a lot of damage to your system. I don't care what studies you've read about benefits. Okay, it's uh, very uh, highly problematic. Now, um, it's also very highly addictive. The level of dopamine is insane. Uh, the amount of pulses of, of dopamine that pulse through your system is, uh, is yeah, incredible. So the level of addictiveness is crazy. Now, what happens when we experience high levels of dopamine within an experience, right? That becomes highly addictive. So our dopamine system starts to desire the experience of high dopamine once again. Why? Because this would help us be motivated to go out and hunt or go out and get water or go out and, uh, you know, seize new land, right? Back in the day, dopamine was a motivation for us to do that in every success would experience a sense of, man, that felt great. I want to do it again, which means that our brain is now programming. Okay. When I go to Lake, uh, what's the call it? Okay. And I find a bunch of deer and I get enough deer for my tribe, right? It feels good. Therefore, my brain's programmed to know exactly what it needs to do in order to go there, get the deer and then bring it back to the tribe. So I can do it next time and next time and next time. Right? And then, of course, you know, tiger shows up, eats all the deer. I no longer have any more deer. I show up next time, I see a tiger. Instead of the dopamine system firing, it suppresses, right? I'm going to actually experience an, a, an ex a painful experience like, oh, man, this sucks, right? Because the anticipation was higher than the experience. Now, I'm also going to know because that punishment system fired not to go there again. So, I'm going to actually stay away from it. I'm less likely to want to go there, even if there's a possibility that the tiger leaves and deer come back, right? I'm less likely to go there. I'm more likely to find somewhere else. That's why we have a strong sense of dopamine. Now, here's what's interesting about dopamine. This is how it's created. Dopamine is something that we can organically produce. So therefore, Okay, it's a non-essential amino acid, okay? And not dopamine itself, but it's precursor. It's precursor meaning the uh, chemical that comes before dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which means it's produced in the brain very quickly, right? And how we know this is because if you see any uh, sports games and, they, um, and you know, the sports athlete or team wins, all of a sudden they're celebrating, they've got all this energy and they've just played you know, 60, 80, 90 minutes, depending on the game, they should be absolutely effed, right? Yet here they are with all this energy. Why? Because dopamine, the neurotransmitter, also is, because it's a motivation compound, a motivation chemical, it gives us neural energy very quickly. So that's what dopamine uh, can do as well. Now, 
how dopamine is created is this. Before dopamine is our dopa, which you can actually get from certain foods, um, but it's yeah, very difficult and you can get it from across the counter, certain things. I don't recommend it personally. I'm not going to make specific recommendations. So just to let you know, when I do make any, when I do say recommend, um, it's more like suggest, I should say, I should probably use that word instead because I'm not here to uh, recommend per se. Um, also, I'm not here to prescribe anything. So just remember, take this stuff with a grain of salt, knowing that I'm not a doctor. Please consult with your doctor um, if you you are looking at any sort of prescription or recommendation specifically. So before our dopa is actually tyrosine or L-tyrosine. So L-tyrosine we can produce within our body. So it's an amino acid we can produce already. However, it's only it's limited to a certain amount. And we can also ingest foods that have L-tyrosine. Okay, so if you just literally go into Google and type in foods that have L-tyrosine, okay, um, I can't remember many of them off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there's, um, I know like um, certain like fish, white meats are very strong, and tyrosine, uh, also, uh, yeah, so generally like sort of meats, uh, eggs from memory, um, and things like almonds, so fatty foods, but usually the, whole, the um, high protein foods are generally the ones that have strong levels of tyrosine. So not that it's necessary for dopamine, however, it definitely helps enhance the amount of dopamine in our system, right? Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because it goes from L-tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine, right? Um, it's not just about how much L-tyrosine uh, we have in our system. It's also how well we can metabolize, okay, tyrosine into L-dopa and L-dopa into dopamine. Okay, because without any tyrosine, it does not matter what you do. It doesn't matter what goals you hit. It doesn't matter what task you achieve or what you do for yourself. You can't produce dopamine without tyrosine. So we need tyrosine. Okay, you can actually, yes, you can supplement these things. Um, again, these, these aren't personally what I recommend because uh, there is significant data. Um, again, this is a suggestion. There is significant data, however, indicating the decrease in natural ability to uh, produce and create certain uh, amino acids like tyrosine when things like that are supplemented and if we take things too close to a utilizable chemical like dopamine for example if you supplement something like L-dopa you're actually inhibiting your natural ability to produce sorry to metabolize tyrosine into L-dopa right so again we when we start start to mess with these things right uh, inorganically then we actually start to come to a situation where we also mess with our ability to metabolize certain compounds and naturally create certain compounds. Okay, um, It's like um, testosterone, right? I've been on testosterone before. What happens if you don't have the right medication and you come off testosterone? What happens? It naturally drops. Okay, They talk about your balls shrink. Okay, Did I say, just say your balls drink? I meant your balls shrink. You can tell how much of a day it's been. All right, your balls shrink. That's what they say. All right, no, they don't actually. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe there are situations where that's the case, but ultimately, what happens is the natural production is dropped massively. And now this is you know, a long time in my past. Uh, so I'm far, far away from anything, any substances like that. Again, not a suggestion at all from my end. No way. Um, but that's you know up to the individual. Anywho, uh, natural production is inhibited. Why? Because it's already getting an inorganic source from outside. So the body doesn't need to produce it. And we have natural inhibitors in our system that, cr that look for a certain level or degree of certain compounds within us. So if we have a high level of dopamine, inhibitory chemicals are produced in our brain to, in to decrease the level of dopamine we use. So even if we've got a lot of dopamine there, all of a sudden these inhibitors get really strong. So you can see that if we start to use something like cocaine too much, our ability to actually use dopamine goes down tremendously over time very quickly. All right? Same with anything when we overdo it. So overdoing it can be actually really problematic. It's not just addictive, but it decreases our motivation chemical in our brain. So you can be, become very demotivated very quickly. Now, uh, dopamine does lead to the... Um, creation of norepinephrine which leads to the cultivation of epinephrine which is uh for those that don't know epinephrine is adrenaline 
All right, and actually I just need to double check two seconds. So sorry, I'm just wanting to get this correct because if I get this wrong, I'm, go I'm not going to feel good about myself. Yes, yeah, so that's correct. So nor adrenaline or norepinephrine no creates epinephrine or adrenaline. Okay, so it's in that order. Now, essentially, all you need to know is it's adrenaline. All right, you don't need to know the difference between the two. Uh, that's for another time. But ultimately, uh, what's happening here is this entire chain of amino acids uh, that gets stimulated, okay, not only do we need the original factor, which is tyrosine, to produce these things, we also, as well, uh, need the ability to metabolize into the next thing. So tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine to noradrenaline or norepinephrine to adrenaline or epinephrine, okay? It's the same thing, really, essentially. Um, like there's a subtle difference, but we won't go into that today. All right, now we can in improve our brain's ability to metabolize tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine by using different things like certain techniques I'm gonna talk about very briefly. And I'm just getting up the, uh, the example template that was shown because that's also going into, uh, that's the sort of thing I'm referring off to so I can sort of make um, some adjustments to what's been shared very commonly on social media. Um, but essentially, certain, ta certain things like um, uh, achieving a goal or completing a task, yes, that can produce dopamine. And when we practice associating uh, joy to the process, that can cultivate a strong sense of dopamine as well. All right, so a great way to uh, create anticipation uh, is also to practice something like visualization. So visualization can actually stimulate dopamine quite powerfully. If you practice visualization in the morning or, um, and you do something that's uh, got some form of reward first thing in the morning, so say you accomplish a couple of tasks, like you make your bed, right? That's quite a common one. Uh, you have a cold shower, so you lean into resistance and you choose to enjoy the leaning in of a resistance, okay, or, or moving into resistance, right? These things are actually producing or um, are actually producing dopamine in the completion of it and in the experience of it, okay? So if you can not only just complete the thing, but you can choose to enjoy, and this is actually something you can choose to do, you choose to enjoy the experience of making your bed, the experience of having that cold shower, the experience of going on your morning run, right? The experience of um, you know, doing all these little bits and bobs and pieces of admin in your morning that you don't want to do and you choose to enjoy it anyway, you're learning how to associate the dopamine uh, uh, mechanism, okay, the dopamine system to those experiences, which brings about stronger levels of motivation to do those things in the morning, next morning, and next morning, and next morning, and you build it and build it and build it. And eventually it becomes a very motivated experience and you actually start to enjoy this whole process more organically. So these are just a few ways you can start to uh, create or produce a lot more dopamine in your system. Some highly recommended uh, things that you can do is to set some stretch goals and some momentum goals. Stretch goals look like you know your big goals that happen over six months, 12 months. Your, your momentum goals are goals that happen you know, every week or every month and you accomplish those constantly. So I actually have a task board that I tick off every week and every day. So I've got a daily and a weekly. And as I tick these off, I practice actually getting satisfaction out of the ticking off, which creates a stronger level of dopamine, which creates a stronger level of excitement within me that I'm on the right path. When you feel you're on the right path, dopamine stimulates. And that's where, again, visualization can be very practical. So self-care activities don't really come under this, to be honest. Um, I, I, I can sort of see, because they sort of mention self-care activities, I can sort of see what they might mean. There's things like, you know, making your bed. Um, you, you know, if, if, if you associate the self-care activity with the completion of something or that specific accomplishment or um, activity is going to help you towards something else, then yes, dopamine can be produced. So you can sort of see how just these simple points don't really cover it very well. Um, 
and it, without understanding the mechanism of dopamine, it's very difficult to actually even actually get sometimes dopamine from any of these things, to be honest, right? unless we understand the association with it. So ultimately, we want our task or our experience to be associated with a future goal or future desire right? that we're anticipating, that we're excited for then we're um, managing to associate the dopamine circuitry to that experience. So I know it's a long-winded one, dopamine. Uh, the other three, trust me, are much shorter, much more succinct. Um, and I know I'm going a little over um, time as I normally would, than I normally would, but um, yeah, it's quite a bit of a topic here. Now, uh, we'll just leave that for dopamine. I don't want to get much more into dopamine. Um, today, I mean, there's so much more I could actually talk about, to be honest, um, but right now I think that, um, yeah, hopefully that gives you guys some food for thought. So remember, just because you eat foods that have tyrosine does not mean that you're going to have dopamine, a lot of dopamine rather, yes, you'll have some, but, um, you know, people that are generally quite depressed, demotivated, don't have high levels of dopamine. The final thing I will mention with dopamine, last thing. You can inhibit the levels of dopamine, meaning you can reduce levels of dopamine, which is unideal, right? If you're seeing a lot of bright light late in the evening. So if you're messing up your circadian circuits, your circadian rhythm, which is your body clock, by seeing lots of bright light and hearing lots of loud noises between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. roughly, you're going to reduce the dopaminergic regions of your brain's ability to produce dopamine. Dopaminergic region, meaning an area that produces dopamine, such as like the habenula, which is an um, easy example. It's a very common one to refer to, right? This activity is reduced, meaning we can't produce as much dopamine, and there's significant research on this. So highly recommend getting a good night's sleep. Also highly recommend as well uh, not viewing super bright lights or staying up too late watching Netflix or anime like myself. I love my anime, right? And that's going to inhibit your ability to produce lots of dopamine okay and it's quite significant if you, um uh, just going to the bathroom all right briefly seeing bright light you'll be okay um but ultimately you want to reduce it significantly if you're up late uh if you're a night shift worker try very low level light low level light and all right i want to encourage and invite as well that uh you are keeping it low light so it's not overhead light it's low light okay light below your eye level ideally that's dopamine, guys. Yes, big winded topic. <laughs> we'll go on to a quick one. Endorphins, okay? Endorphins is a, are a neuropeptide, okay? Neuropeptide, all right? Now, a neuropeptide uh, is released much slower than a neurotransmitter like dopamine, all right? So it does in induce a little slower. Now, they talk about it being the painkiller, which, yes, it does come up during pain, and it helps reduce pain as well. So when you have a very painful experience, you release a lot of adrenaline, right? It comes from dopamine. So endorphins are actually quite closely associated with dopamine, which is interesting. Uh, if you're producing dopamine, you're probably producing endorphins as well. Now, ultimately, uh, uh, they not only get produced during an experience of pain, also if they're produced, they can reduce and inhibit the experience of pain as well. Now, uh, I can't remember exactly where, um, I believe it's the hypothalamus. Um, someone will need to correct me on that. I, or no, it's a pituitary gland. I believe it's a pituitary gland uh, that uh, produces endorphins uh, primarily. And uh, they talk about exercise, listening to music, watching a movie and laughing. And I'm actually quite on point. They're actually quite on point with these. I'm actually a big fan of these. Um, uh, so yes, exercise. However, if you're um, the degree of endorphins that are released during exercise will differ during um, depending on the type of exercise. So if it's really high level, of, like your heart rate's quite high, it's going to produce much more endorphin. Okay, much more endorphins in your system. Okay, in your brain. You're um, also if you are enjoying the exercise, that's also going to uh, relates to a greater level of endorphins in the system, okay? Now, many studies have shown exercise in, um, increasing your ability to produce endorphins as well. So if you are not exercising, even getting out for 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day and just going for a walk is greatly beneficial for your endorphin system as well. 
Okay, now listen to music, not just any music, music you genuinely enjoy. All right, that's a big one. Uh, and doing this and finding times in your day when you can just listen to a song, whether it's in your car, on the way to work, right? This is always a great one and actually feel into the music. That's the crucial part. If you're just listening to the music and you're letting your mind drift, it's not going to really release endorphins at all unless you're actually focused on the music. You're in the beat and you feel it, okay? Same with watching a movie. Just watching a movie, no. But if you're actually watching a movie and you're genuinely enjoying the movie and you're genuinely involved in the movie, then you're going to have an endorphin experience. But just watching a movie, no. Okay. Again, laughing, that's, yeah, you can't really, <laughs> like, you can't really go wrong with that one. If you're laughing, you're freaking laughing, okay? So you're going to have some endorphins in your system, in your brain, going haywire. So uh, we get the drift, we get the point, endorphins are very straight forward, all right? And they're pretty on point. Now, other things that might um, yeah, increase levels of endorphins in your system, all right? Um, uh, yes, various drugs can contribute, but you can get this drug free very easily. Um, simply doing things that you personally enjoy. What I'd love to invite is even if you're just doing one thing a day that you genuinely enjoy, can improve the levels of endorphins in your system and your brain, improving your overall mood on a daily basis as well. Now, no specific foods are necessary for your endorphins, so don't worry about this one. This one is already residing in your mate. So you're all good. Um, so we'll just conclude endorphins quite quickly because that's a very um, simple one. If you're focusing on the dopamine system and the, t and the tools that I've given you there, the endorphin factor is going to be um, pretty um, closely related anyway. Uh, and looking at the dopamine point, I said self-care activities in there. That actually probably comes more under the endorphin uh, region anyway um, when you're doing things that are good for you. In fact, that probably goes even more under the serotonin, to be honest. But yeah, you get my, get my drift with that one. Let's go another short one. We'll do serotonin last. Oxytocin. Oxytocin, the love hormone, is what they say. So again, it's a neuropeptide and peptide hormone. Okay, so meaning it's produced in the brain and the body. Again, uh, no particular foods are necessary for this one. This just happens um, when you're in an experience. And it says socializing, physical touch, petting animals, helping others. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've wanted to do that on a podcast. <laughs> anyway, uh, ultimately, yes, there um, it can come into play, but it's not just show socializing. It's not just physical touch or petting animals or helping others. It's the oxytocin is the hardest one out of all of these to produce by far. All right. The, um, the level of oxytocin one will produce during these things is very limited unless you're with probably your partner and only if you've got a very good relationship with that partner as well. So it's, it, oxytocin is more so for good old love making. All right. And I'll help and, you know, continue our species, basically. Uh, that's really why oxytocin is there, is it helps us move towards lovemaking and helps us enjoy lovemaking um, in, in, in certain ways, but also it helps um, incorporate levels of unconditional love, which helps partnerships and helps the support and security of family in most situations, ideally in all situations. But yes, as today's world, as most, as, you know, most situations. So uh, if say someone has a child, all right, a woman has a child, um, ultimately uh, there's going to be a high release of oxytocin in the brain and body that occurs. And these peptides are going to be flowing through the system. The, the woman's going to feel good and she's going to, you know, see her child and she's going to be like, oh, she's so beautiful. Um, even if she throws flute on the floor, okay, even if she messes up, pees her pants, all these different things, all right, pees his pants, whatever. Um, yeah, she's going to love him. She's going to love her. She's going to love him. Why? Oxytocin. Oxytocin is a sweetness experience, right? That feeling where, oh man, it feels so sweet to be with this person or to be with this pet or to be with this um, experience, whatever that is. Now, right, after some time, the levels of oxytocin produced by the woman after birth slowly reduce over time. Eventually, oh, you peed your pants again? Oh, you threw your toy away? All right, oh, you didn't eat your food? Right, so all of a sudden, 
we come into a situation where that unconditional love is slowly shifting to a little bit more of a conditional love, okay? Because the natural production of oxytocin is reduced. Oxytocin can reduce levels of pain as well, all right? So, for example, if you've been in a strong argument with your partner and you guys make up and you have some makeup sex or you have a good cuddle, all right, really loving cuddle, all right, it reduces very quickly the pain that was experienced before that. Another, th another thing as well, if, say, you hurt yourself physically and you see your, the person that you love, a lot of oxytocin is produced and it blunts the pain response quite strongly. So oxytocin can blunt the pain response as well. So oxytocin, I wouldn't worry too much about this one. Um, you can experience it through mindful meditation. Uh, so if you're, if you're practicing a form of meditation called compassion or compassionate meditation, Right, so if you practice compassion, which is a meditative um, practice that you can do, you can just YouTube this, or you can find you know, recorded audios on many meditations, um, meditation apps, compassion meditation, and it's a great way to practice yeah, the production of oxytocin. Right? Um, and again, if, you're, if you feel very lovingly towards a person or a pet, then, only then, and if you're interacting with them in a way that you experience the sweetness of emotion, then. And only then will you uh, experience uh, yeah, levels of oxytocin that come through. Otherwise, it will be very limited. Awesome. Oh, there we go. So we had a couple of pauses there because I sort of have things popping up on my phone. And then, um, oh, I'm meant to be at dinner with my parents. So all these different things going on. <laughs> Now we're going to tie it up by touching on serotonin. So I'm going to keep this short and succinct as well, as much as possible. So they talk about the mood stabilizers. Now, that's already something that's not quite correct. It's more so the I have enough chemical and calming chemical. So when we produce serotonin because we feel like we have enough, we also calm down. Right. Now, um, so I can sort of see where they come from with the mood stabilizer. Now, serotonin is a, um, gosh, uh, what's the word, neuro, uh, so neurotransmitter and hormone, all right, uh, so basically it means it's produced in the brain and the body. Now, serotonin, all right, comes from uh, tryptophan. Tryptophan produces 5-HTP, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and that produces serotonin, which is 5-HT. All right, now this then goes on and creates melatonin. So if you don't have very much serotonin, you're probably not going to sleep well, okay, because you're going to have a lack of melatonin. Now, uh, yes, um, so serotonin, it actually needs to be ingested, so we can't produce um tryptophan okay and we can't produce 5-htp unless we've got tryptophan so ultimately uh, we do need to eat foods that have tryptophan in them and they're generally more high carb foods also yes meats do have um, lots of tryptophan as well i believe turkey is a one that has a strong level of that um, but ultimately yeah um, things like oats from my understanding nuts as well uh, fish all those sort of things uh, do have high levels of um, tryptophan as well. So tryptophan and tyrosine, right, gets confusing with the TRs. Now, uh, ultimately, they are talking about getting some sun, which is, yes, um, pretty correct, mindfulness, relax in nature, meditate. Now, the getting in some sun aspect, you've got to be able to get it through your eyes. And it's not about being indoors and looking at the light. It's about being outdoors and incorporating high levels of lux, meaning a measurement of light, so high levels of light coming in through your eyeballs, okay, <laughs> through your eye sockets, and getting this light into you, all right? So it's not, it doesn't matter if it touches your skin, you're not going to get some serotonin reaction, but basically, by if you incorporate high levels of light throughout your day, meaning you're getting outdoors, even on a cloudy day, you're going to get more light in your eyes, even on a cl dark, cloudy day, than artificial light indoors, unless you've got very strong artificial light, which is actually quite difficult to get. I, get. I can almost guarantee the lights in your house do not have that ability. 
Now, ultimately, uh, uh, that's why they talk about red light therapy. So if you're not getting much light or you're a night shift worker, red light therapy can be beneficial here. Other than that, the best method is definitely natural sunlight or naturally just getting outside. So uh, ultimately, it doesn't mean that you're going to stimulate it, but it just means if you, do, if you don't get enough light, you're actually inhibiting it. That's what it means. Okay. Now, mindfulness it talks about, yes, definitely. So if you're practicing mindfulness in a way that you're practicing either gratitude or you're practicing uh, mindfulness meditation, meaning you're coming to a place of contentment and a feeling of I have enough, you're also stimulating serotonin. The other thing, okay, relaxing in nature, okay, yes, okay, if you're relaxing in nature and you feel safe, if you feel safe, that's the component here, yes, you'll produce serotonin, okay, so yeah, it talks about meditating, so meditating comes under the umbrella of mindfulness anyway. Now, ultimately, it's coming down to the experience of I have enough, so if in any of these things uh, occur, all right, and you don't feel content or safe, you will not produce serotonin. So that's the dominant factor here. Now, um, other things that can come to this, um, it's not just about a gratitude practice. It's about practicing gratitude in the way that works for you and that you connect with it experientially and emotionally. What this means is if you are practicing gratitude and you're just writing it in your journal, I used to do this, I did this for two years, didn't get any result. That was just me. Many people, you know, get great benefits from this. But ultimately, just doing that, I was disconnected from it. So what I ended up doing was I ended up actually, and also I'm, I was recording on my phone to get the video, but my phone just died because this is going a lot longer than I thought. But ultimately, if you can close your eyes and actually appreciate, okay, wow, I've got this. Like this is, like I've had this in my life. This is an experience that I've had Thank you. Right? If you can really come to that place, you're going to release serotonin. And if you don't feel connected to that, rather than using the words in your mind, I am grateful for, shift it and come to, I could be grateful for. I could be grateful for. I could be grateful for the trees. I could be grateful for the bird sounds. I could be grateful for my partner, for my friends, for my family. Right, for my job, for the, my financial stability, right? Whatever that is for you, I could be grateful for that. Using those words, yes, they're not as powerful. However, if you can connect with them stronger, more strongly, then you're more likely to release serotonin as well in those situations. Now, you'll also have to excuse me chiming on in here as I have literally just been away for like three hours, uh, hanging with my parents, having dinner with them, um, with uh, my mate Steve, and uh, here I am back three hours later um, because I quite literally remembered as I was driving out there uh, quite a few things that I realized, actually, I've completely forgot to talk about that. And I completely talk, forgot to talk about this. So here I am at 10.30 at night, literally my bedtime, being like, actually, you know what? I've got a little bit more juice that I really wanted to share before I head off to bed and then shoot this off to good old Selena. You rock, Selena. Thank you for um, taking care of the whole of the, or literally all the back end of the pocket coach um, from uh, two episodes ago uh, to now and going forward is literally thanks to her. So big thank you to her. Anyway, uh the first thing I wanted to touch on before we conclude this episode is the fact that dopamine is stimulated 
uh, by motivation, yes, but also forward momentum, right, which is essentially motivation. So ultimately, when you're creating forward momentum or you're on the right path, you're stimulating dopamine. Now, uh, say you go for a walk. If you go for a walk, literally uh, visual aspects that are passing by your vision laterally, that's going to stimulate dopamine. So as you're walking, which is forward momentum, you're going to trigger dopamine and you're going to trigger dopamine when things are passing you by laterally. So when you're going for a walk, naturally, you know, trees, uh, buildings, uh, objects, people, you know, that's all passing by you. Therefore, that's going to stimulate more dopamine. So that's why going for a walk or a run or a bike ride is very powerful for stimulating more dopamine. Um, and other ways that you can stimulate dopamine as well is a strong form of breath work. And what I mean by that, not just breathing, okay? For those out there that don't know breath work, <laughs> uh, as my non-spiritual friends like to, to like to say, oh, I can breathe. <laughs> hey, yeah, well, great. Um, yeah, maybe it's not for you. <laughs> maybe it's not for you then. That's all good. And uh, what you can do though, and what you can understand is that by practicing oxygenating breath work, such as Wim Hof practices, okay? So... <laughs> where you're taking in more oxygen than the amount of carbon dioxide you're exhaling. Uh, it's going to, it's called super oxygenating breathing. Uh, this stimulates adrenaline or epinephrine in the system, which also stimulates dopamine because dopamine is a precursor to uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? Um, so ultimately what's happening is if you are feeling unmotivated, right, going for a walk and practicing something like breath work are two practical things to bring your motivation back up. Okay. That's the first. If you're interested in Wim Hof, okay, you can search it up. You can do like two, three rounds. I recommend starting slow. Uh, and also, please, if you have any uh, breathing issues or resp respiratory issues, okay, please consult with your physician or doctor or specialist first before practicing breath work. Um, now, so that's on the dopamine side. Also, if you want to enhance the amount of dopamine in your life in general, uh, as I mentioned earlier, momentum and stretch goals are great. All right. So if you're working towards this, a big goal, all right, make sure that there's momentum goals spaced across that point all the way up to the stretch goal. Right. And as you complete each momentum goal, pause and celebrate. All right. And see internal validation that leads to the dopamine reward, not the external accomplishment. So if you just achieve the external compliment and you go, okay, next thing. That's literally a one-way ticket to burnout and a one-way ticket to probably um, even worse than burnout, sometimes a depressive experience, this feeling of hopelessness, this feeling of I'm not getting anywhere, right, if you're not validating. So internal validation is crucial for sustainability in work. Right? I haven't had a proper burnout in a very long time. I used to burn myself out. I used to burn <laughs> myself out like crazy um, because I'd be chasing, 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 no validating and burnout. And then I'd spiral down into depression, into can't be bothered doing anything, no motive, like just no interest, no passion. It feels horrible. Now I've suffered depression before, right? Before I went, was able to be motivated as a human very badly. So I basically had very little dopamine in my system because I was so unmotivated. And as my parents would say, quote unquote, lazy. Now laziness, yes, but really it was depression, right? And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, share that point. So that's dopamine. Uh, and if you are lacking motivation, if you're feeling depressive, uh, the tips that I've shared with you around dopamine, please use them. Okay, these are mechanisms that have been, uh, yeah, that are very valid, uh, very studied in depth uh, in literature. Now. Uh, when it comes to the validation aspect, if you can find something daily to create some form of validation, that is the most practical thing you could do for yourself. Uh, you know, once a week's good, but once a day is even better. Or even better than that, multiple times a day, pausing, validating what you've accomplished already that day, and then continuing, that can stimulate dopamine as well, alongside using the breath, like super oxygenating breathing. Now, on the flip side, I also want to touch on a little bit more around serotonin, uh, some practical things that you can do. One is uh, the uh, slowing down of breathing, pausing, and gratifying your situation. All right, so that's uh, basically coming to a situation where you're making longer exhales and inhales. You're calming yourself, and in that place, 
I'd invite you, Evan, to start to observe your surroundings, become very present with everything, and practice some form of gratifying or gratitude for your situation or surrounding. Doing that more frequently towards the end of the day helps you to come to a calmer state. Remember, serotonin is a precursor to melatonin. This actually starts to help you get ready for a deeper slumber that evening. So it's fantastic for winding you down for those difficult sleepers out there. I will do a proper sleep episode at some stage where I'll go into depth on how to improve the depth of your sleep and the quality of your sleep and all this misinformation out there about sleep as well. I'll clarify a lot on that. The sleep is far more crucial than literally even you guys might even have heard of in terms of when it comes to mental health. It is insanely crucial, insanely, and especially crucial as well for performance, which I'll speak on when the podcast comes around. Um, there's a lot of us, including myself, for a long time was um, doing it wrong. <laughs> there's a lot of um, yeah misunderstandings around sleep and things that just aren't generally talked about that are actually really important around how you can go into a deeper and get more out of your sleep. And um, the other thing as well, just before we conclude, um, with the oxytocin experience, all right, as I mentioned, you can be in nature. Now, remember, it's a sweetness of emotion. So when you learn to be more present, because uh, presence is a practice, and when you practice compassion with things around you, so I love to go to waterfalls. I practice compassion for the sound of the waterfall when I'm meditating. I practice compassion for my the energy and emotion that's flowing through my system through my body and as i'm practicing that right, i'm feeling so much compassion for the experience itself right this has been you know many years of practice around meditation so i've been enabled um, to be able to do that now compared to in the past when i'd be so anxious sitting there for one minute and so overwhelmed by emotion um and so stuck in depression and um yeah you know i've come very far but that's because of consistent practice right and it's very possible for anyone to do, anyone that has these hormones, which is quite literally everyone that's listening to this podcast, <laughs> has that ability to develop these tendencies to uh, uh, relearn how to metabolize these chemicals uh, more proficiently in their system by understanding the mechanisms and practicing the mechanisms. So an ideal day would look like this. Morning, right? Um, utilizing dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine stimulation. So something like you know, cold showers, ticking a few things off, um, some quick admin, and um, breath work would be fantastic, right? Even maybe even some stillness in there to stay focused as well, right? So doing a focus practice like focusing on your breathing for a little while or whatever that might be for you. For me, I practice a very long period or bout of stillness, usually 30 minutes to an hour. In the morning actually so i get up quite early do all that stuff activate my system then practice stillness to enable myself to stay focused for the day right stimulating acetylcholine in the system um, and st stimulating norepinephrine actually as well when i'm practicing focus okay and now from there i go about my day constantly and many bounce not just um, pause and validate and celebrate my accomplishments throughout the day i'll also practice gratitude and pausing and slowing down my breath throughout the day because I'll take pauses which help me to rejuvenate and recover my state of focus so that I can go into my next bout of focus more intensely and effectively, right? So basically, I'll go through usually sort of 90-minute bouts, which is an ultradian cycle, right? Um, I'll talk more about ultradian cycles when I talk about sleep. And ultimately, uh, at the end of every um, these ultradian cycles, I'll yeah, pause uh, validate my accomplishments uh, you um, you know a lot of the time not all the time this isn't every 90 minutes by the way guys I'm not a robot <laughs> this is whenever I'm in bouts of work and then I'll practice some presence and compassion for the things that are around me and then I'll come back into the feeling or frequency of where I want to be what I want to create and I move into that I use visualization a lot in the morning as well so I should have shared that earlier um, and then come the end of the day, I practice a lot of gratitude at the end of the day as well, and a lot of presence at the end of the day and reflection, things like that. And that really helps me to come to a calmer state before going into a deep slumber. So that's ultimately my routine. I usually once a week have a good amount of time, quite a few hours on one day each week where I'm completely immersed in nature as well, 
practicing my compassion um, with things around me. So enhancing levels of ox oxytocin in my system uh, that way as well. Um, and endorphins just flow and follow. Um, basically everything I've shared, I always ensure that I'm in situations to allow me to laugh. So you'll hear me laugh a lot on these podcasts and that's just generally my personality now. Um, yeah, definitely never used to be like that, guys. Trust me. <laughs> um, I used to have to fake laugh and that's why my laugh is probably so boisterous today. Anywho, finally we come to a conclusion. I'd love to wish you all the best. Subscribing would be very fantastic. Um, sharing this podcast would also be very, very fantastic. Um, like I mentioned at the start, guys, um, I don't um, do any paid advertisement or anything like that. Don't, um, I'm not paid for any of this stuff. Um, I'm just doing it because I want to share this with people that need it. So if you feel that you gained anything from this, please do your boy. And anyone else that would obviously end up benefiting a favor and um, please share um, leaving reviews and all that sort of stuff helps tremendously, guys. It really does. Um, thank you so much. I love you guys. And if you want, if you have got any topics that you're interested in or you want to learn more about or you'd like me to just do a riff on it, let me know. I am so down for that. So, so down. Love you guys. Have a beautiful day, beautiful afternoon, beautiful evening. And take care. That's why I do this for you.